Low back pain worldwide is one of the most common complaints that we can see, second most common in the office. We've seen a couple of uh, lectures at this point already that is focused in on some of the um, demographics and some of the problems that we've seen. So this is just kind of a summary of some of those same things. Back pain causes, deconditioning, sprains and strains, spondylolisthesis, spondylolysis, facet syndrome, disc herniation. These are all causes of back pain, bulging, spinal stenosis, biomechanical injuries, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, such as inflammatory problems, infections, and cancer. Um, with the focus being on degenerative disc disease, recent research has showed that majority of these things has some predisposition from a genetic standpoint. Heredity factors actually play much more of a role in disc pathology than most people know and most that we give credit for. Yes, there are acute injuries that cause disc problems, but a lot of this actually, just like most things that we are finding in, in, in many other areas of the body, is related to hereditary and genetic factors. This is some research that was actually done in China, and they actually did some genetic coding and found out that there is a predisposition, just like things for asthma and, and allergies, that people are more inclined to have actually disc pathology than others secondary to their parents. This is where the problem is, looking and focusing on the disc, the disc itself. Um, looking at the disc, it sits into an impression and actually in the bone, in this six here is actually the ring hypothesis. This is the bone itself. There's depression within the bone where the disc sits. Number nine would be the lamina. There's 10 to 15 rings within the annulus fibrosis that contains um, the high-pressured annulus. Moving further inward is the nucleus pulposa, which we all know about. And looking posteriorly, here is number seven, is the posterior longitudinal ligament. It actually gives support to the posterior portion of the disc. Uh, eight would be the epidural space. Four would be the cauda equina. Five is the facet, which we just had a good lecture on, knowing some issues regarding the set, facets, the spinal nerve. But one interesting thing is here is the SN, the sinovertebral nerve. And, and you can see how that sinovertebral nerve actually innervates the posterior portion of the disc itself. From a vascular standpoint, the disc is one of the least vascularized substances in the body. Consequently, it's very hard for it to heal since it gets so little blood supply. From a vascular standpoint, only the posterior portion of the disc actually itself has any direct blood supply. Most of the blood that gets to the disc and nutrients that get to the disc is actually diffused through the inferior end plate of the bone here and the one superior. So you can see that the nutrients come to the annulus and to the nucleus actually from the blood vessels that are related to the bone that diffuse across. That's why discs are so difficult in their healing, is because of that lack of blood supply. Moving on further and looking more at some of the, the vascular, or lack of vascular innervation to the, to the disc itself, you can see here, number one, these are the segmental radicular arteries in the bone itself on the vertebrae. Their interosseous arteries are here, number two. And then the capillary tuff is right in this particular portion, superior to the disc. And it's through these capillary tufts that actually the diffusion of the nutrients go into the disc itself. This is looking at the neurological innervation to the posterior column of the spinal, uh, spinal column. You can see here that that sinovertebral nerve that I was speaking of earlier, how it comes here, it innervate, has some ascending branches and has some descending branches. It innervates the posterior longitudinal ligament, but if you can see here, some of the branches actually innervate the annulus fibrosis. So the, the nerves themselves actually enter into the disc, and it's some of the reasons why we actually see pain with things that are non-disc herniations, Looking a little further, this is actually a photograph of the sinovertebral nerve as it courses through the disc itself. I thought this was a pretty impressive picture. I've never seen that before. So focusing in on the disc itself and the problem that the disc causes, there is significant degeneration. There's usually a change in the hydrostatic pressure. The disc lacks oxygen lacks glucose, changes in the pH level, and death of protolytic glycans. 
Now recent studies show that the matrix that makes up the disc is formed by these proteolytic glycans. They're high, highly glycosylated protein substances that bind together, that give the disc its matrix and its strength and its structure. This is an example of a proteolytic glycan. This is actually from cartilage itself. Now the disc, both the annulus and the nucleus pulposa, have a similar structure, but about half the size. The disc itself has a higher portion of keratin sulfate as part of its proteolytic glycan on this core protein structure. This core protein structure binds with others core protein structures to form this hyaluronic acid, which forms the matrix that makes up the annulus as well as the nucleus pulposus. In disc degeneration, you can see that this is a healthy proteolytic glycan, and this is one that you can see is problematic and has pathology. So when these proteolytic glycans break down, you lose the matrix formation that makes up the annulus and makes up the nucleus pulposa. So when these are broken down in this way, you get annular tears. There are three forms of annular tears. There's a rim lesion, which you can see here. There'll be a concentric lesion that actually goes down the lamina that we spoke of, I spoke of earlier with 15 to 20 of those in the annulus. And then you can also have a radial tear, which is here. And the radial tear is the one that leads to the nucleus pulposa protruding out the, through the annulus and possibly calling spinal stenosis or neuroforamal stenosis or pinching of the nerve itself. And again, you can see these end plate structures here. This is again how the nucleus and the annulus gets their nutrients. When you, find, when you have the breaking down of those proteolytic glycans, then we look at our MRIs and we find the infamous dark shaded or the black disc where that uh, water content has been lost, the nutrients has been lost. One of the reasons for presenting this in this fashion is that a lot of times when people present with back pain, we often will do an exam, we'll get an MRI, and based on our MRI and our exam, whether they have a little tear, maybe a little disc protrusion, we try to sometimes relate that to the, the amount of pain that the person is having. However, what we see from a disc pathology standpoint on the MRI oftentimes has very little to do with how much pain a person is in. My history is that I've seen people with significantly large herniations and nerve root compressions with very little pain and people with small annual tears and they can't hardly get out of the bed, they can't go to work. So consequently, there's not a correlation between what we see MRI-wise and how much pain that the person has, particularly if it's, a, if it's an annular tear. I've, I've seen a number of patients that said, I've seen other doctors and they told me I shouldn't hurt this badly. And if you have an understanding of what the tear is, that there's neurological innervation, you can actually get ridiculous symptoms just from the tear because through that tear, you can actually have some of the nucleus pulposa seeping through the tear and causing irritation to the sinovertebral nerve. And that's only with, looking, with seeing an MRI that has a tear. This is an example of that. You can see there's an internal disruption of the annulus. The nucleus pulposa material is starting to seep out, and it hasn't even uh, herniated at this point. In fact, it's not even bulging, but yet it's irritating the sinovertebral nerve, which comes off the spinal nerve, which can send pain down the leg, and you can have actually, again, as I said earlier, ridiculous symptoms.